Now you talk about terror. What about for me? I've been terrorized all my day. I'm all my day. When the new $20 bill is issued in 2030, it is scheduled to have on one side a portrait of Harriet Tubman, the fiery abolitionist who made over a dozen clandestine trips south to free enslaved people and later served as a scout for the Union Army during the Civil War. And on the back, it is supposed to have a statue of the slave-holding seventh president, Andrew Jackson, who was one of the principal organizers of the genocidal campaigns against Native Americans. It is a bit like Germany issuing a bill with Anne Frank on one side and Adolf Eichmann on the other. This schizophrenia reflects the bifurcation within the United States, where the dwindling majority of whites often embrace the so-called white replacement theory seen in the effort to honor the nation's diversity and own up to the sins of white supremacy, a campaign to erase them. The fight over symbols and monuments is grounded in this fear of dethronement. For, as Aaron L. Thompson writes, monuments aren't history lessons. They're pledges of allegiance. Owning up to our past, the goal of critical race theory shatters the myth perpetuated by white supremacists that our racial hierarchy is not somehow engineered, but the natural outcome of a meritocracy where whites are endowed with superior intelligence, talent, and civilization, while blacks deserve to be at the bottom of society because of their innate characteristics. Owning up to the past eradicates the whitewashing in textbooks, monuments, memorials, and historical narratives, and forces white Americans to grapple with a history every bit as evil as that perpetuated by German fascists. As Clarence Luzanne, the author of $20 and Change, Harriet Tubman, and the ongoing fight for racial justice and democracy argues, rolling out a Tubman $20 bill not only disrupts and diminishes the legacies of white supremacy, that persist in official narratives, but that doing so is a necessary step toward diminishing and abolishing racist distortions of our political economy, health, and medical institutions, and justice system. Joining me to discuss this battle over national symbols and monuments is Professor Clarence Lusain, the Director of International Affairs Program and the Interim Chair of the Political Science Department, at Howard University. So let's just begin quickly. Uh, she's a remarkable figure, uh, Harriet Tubman. Uh, I, I, just for people who don't know, just a brief outline of who she was and why she was important. So for, uh, first of all, thank you for having me, uh, Chris. And uh, this really is an important topic. And Harriet Tubman is a great character uh, to talk about the issue of symbolism and importance. So for basically anybody that's been to an American school uh, and had at least a fourth grade education, somewhere along the way, you learned about Harriet Tubman. Uh, But mostly what you learned was that she uh, helped people escape from slavery. She escaped herself and then she made a number of trips back down to free her family and friends. And she kind of gets frozen at that. Uh, What I try to do in this book is to widen the lens and look at her overall broader life, where not only did she fight to end slavery, but she also fought for women's rights. She fought for voting rights. She spoke out against uh, injuries uh, and people who uh, who were infirm. Uh, She spoke out for people who were poor. So Harriet Tubman, for me, represents really the epitome of someone who's fighting for a broader democracy Uh, in the country. And then you compare that to, as you mentioned, Andrew Jackson, who not only was someone who uh, was uh, a participant in massacres against uh, Native Americans, uh, his administration led to the uh, infamous and tragic Trail of Tears. Uh, He was also an enslaver uh, and a slave trader. 
And then a lot of people also know him or project him as someone who founded the uh, Democratic Party. Uh, But it was a Democratic Party and it was a vision of democracy completely in opposite to that of Harriet Tubman. For Andrew Jackson, his uh, understanding of democracy was white privileged men. And so you really have two contrasting individuals, but more generally, two contrasting visions of what the society should be about, who should be represented, where the society should be headed. Let's talk about monuments. Uh, So you have end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, uh, large numbers of Confederate monuments put up, uh, courthouse lawns, you write, state house grounds. Uh, strategically erected to serve as reminders to black folks that those institutions had no regard for them. Uh, Whites, you know, may pass a statue of Robert E. Lee and think of it as benign, uh, but blacks can't. Uh, and, uh, and, And you write about this. So talk about the choice of those who are honored and the role of the monuments as part of the subjugation and ultimately the reign of terror uh, that is carried out under Jim and Jane Crow against Black people? So monuments and statutes and buildings that are named after individuals, all of this symbolism is not benign. It represents a position, a position on history, a position on society. Uh, as you noted, many of the statues that came about Uh, that honored the Confederacy didn't come right after the Civil War when it was clear to everybody what the Civil War was about, that it had been about defending slavery. It came as a part of the lost cause and a reconstructed history that made the Confederacy as something noble, as it was fighting against government overreach and that these were actually heroes. And so those monuments were not about the Civil War. They were about post-Reconstruction politics of race. And particularly because they were in the South, although there were some outside of the South, uh, it was to reinforce and reiterate every single day the Jim Crow segregation that Black people and other people of color uh, had to deal with. So the uh, objection to these monuments didn't come as kind of a uh, rebuttal against whites in general, but it came across and was there from the beginning by African-Americans. And you're talking about Black leaders from W.B. Du Bois to Marcus Garvey to other Black leaders who all spoke out uh, because it was recognized from the top to the bottom that these really did represent an argument for the continuation of Jim Crow and the continuing oppression of Black people, Native Americans, uh, and Latinos in this country. But it was also accompanied or part of a historical erasure. One, which you write about in the book, the number of slave revolts. I think if I remember right, you said 250. I didn't know it was that large. Uh, But also Reconstruction, when you had that brief period when Northern troops were occupying the South and Uh, Blacks were allowed uh, to gain political office. So it wasn't just about honoring. It was also about uh, disappearing history. Can you address that? Yes, I I have lamented for years that we do not teach enough about Reconstruction. So most broader uh, history in the U.S. tends to think of you had slavery, you had the Civil War, you had Jim Crow, then you had the Civil Rights Movement. And it erases this really important uh, moment between 1867 and 1877 when there was an effort on the part of the U.S. federal government to take responsibility not only for how people who had been enslaved had been treated, but to offer remedies, which included a specific bank that was created to give uh, African-Americans opportunities to to take out loans, for example, to start businesses, to uh, buy properties. You had the Freedmen's Bureau, which promoted education and created schools. 
And these schools were actually multiracial. The first time many whites in the South actually were able to go to school was during Reconstruction. And then you also had Black political participation where you had African-Americans who had been enslaved in the 1850s who were in Congress, who were in state legislatures, who were in city councils in the 1870s. So it was a remarkable period. And because of that period, after it was crushed uh, in 1877 with the Hayes-Tilden Compromise, where uh, the two political parties reached a deal that uh, Rutherford B. Hayes would be given the presidency and, and basically they would stop protecting uh, free Black people in the South. Uh, after that period, uh, it was the strength of Black people having learned politics, learned how to survive, that prepared people for the next hundred years of Jim Crow. Uh, so it's a really, really critical era. And again, there's very little uh, taught. And of course, that then gets reflected. There's almost no symbolism, uh, public symbolism, uh, about Reconstruction as opposed to, for example, the Confederacy. So I want to read this passage from your book. I found it fascinating that these memorials, these monuments, uh, are not just about uh, honoring a, a particular period of white supremacy and a perpetuation of white supremacy as well as erasure of huge uh, parts of history, but they also influence political behavior in the present. You write, a 2021 study by researchers at the University of Virginia confirmed that there is a direct correlation between Confederate monuments and white racial terror concluding that, and this is in quotes, the number of lynching victims in a county is a positive and significant predicator of the number of Confederate memorializations in that county. Yeah, so it's absolutely true that these monuments, these statues are narratives, and they not only tell a story, but they also offer a form of action. And so we see this time and time and time again. Uh, there was a case coming out of uh, Georgia, I believe, or Tennessee, uh, where there was a courtroom. And in this courtroom, uh, it was basically a uh, pay, uh, pageant to uh, the Confederacy. And there was a successful lawsuit from a Black defendant who argued that the fact that you would have a jury room where the Confederacy would be celebrated was prejudicial. And that you can look at in a broader context that throughout the region where you had these Confederate uh, monuments and statues, you had the KKK, you had the White Citizens Councils. Uh, we saw all of this really come to crest in 2017 in uh, Virginia with the Unite the Right rally which I will remind people was about defending the Confederate statutes, Robert E. Lee. And it was the most extreme, but not the only, and certainly not the unusual defense uh, that we've seen, which has animated those who feel most that they are being replaced, uh, who have bought into this argument uh, that African-Americans, Latinos, Muslims, immigrants from the third world are coming to replace uh, them. And the only way to defend that is through undemocratic and even violent uh, means. I want to talk about reparations, affirmative action. But before I do, I want to read a short passage from your book. In numerous studies from Eric Williams' classic Slavery and Capitalism to Edward Baptiste, the half has never been told, slavery in the making of American capitalism. Historians and economists have documented how the U.S. economy from the pre-Revolutionary War period until the last days of slavery was built on the backs of enslaved African people and their descendants. At the onset of the Civil War in 1861, white people enslaved 3.9 million, 88 percent, of the 4.3 million black people in the United States. The abolition of slavery represented the victory of an industrial aristocracy over an agrarian one. The emancipatory politics of Tubman, Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, Nat Turner, and others overlapped with the interests of wealthy Northerners who founded the Republican Party and created an inevitable clash 
that led to the Civil War. First, that's a very important point, that uh, this was an economic battle between the North and the South uh, with kind of the cover of slavery. Uh, uh, But I think it begins to address uh, with the all of us who do argue for reparations uh, have long said that that uh, African Americans enslaved African Americans built almost everything in this country, uh, including the Capitol um, and I believe the White House. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, and originally affirmative action. I want you to address this because we're now uh, watching a Supreme Court on the cusp of essentially abolishing affirmative action when it was set up by Lyndon Johnson, was set up as a way to uh, uh, essentially acknowledge the economic contribution of African Americans. And uh, I think that famous Johnson quote, when you have your foot on a man's neck for 300 years and then you finally take the boot off his neck, you can't uh, call that, uh, you know, an an equal starting point. Again, butchering the quote. Um, And that affirmative is action itself kind of got distorted, but it wasn't originally designed for diversity. Uh, It was designed uh, because of the economic contribution of African Americans in the United States for which they were never compensated, especially, of course, immediately after the Civil War, where and then you get uh, convict leasing and everything else. But but talk about that and talk a little bit about what's happening right now when we watch uh, what little gains have been made, uh, essentially, uh, it, it looks like a, about to be rolled back. So thank you for that question. So the calls for reparation, uh, without using that term, go all the way back to the beginning of the U.S. It was, it was long acknowledged and understood by Black people that they were being exploited, that their labor was being uh, building the economy, and as you point out, of the entire country. It wasn't just the South. The North benefited as well through factories, through insurance, through financing. Uh, So it was a national problem uh, that never was addressed, but was always a component of the African-American freedom movement prior to uh, the Civil War, after the Civil War, during the Civil Rights era. Uh, It was an issue that never went away. Uh, Martin Luther King, for example, uh, again, did not use the term reparations, but he certainly talked about a debt that was owed as a result of not only slavery, but the post-slavery era uh, in Jim Crow. And the wealth that, again, was built up through the exploitation of Black people uh, during the Jim Crow era. For example, uh, Black people were not eligible in, in most instances for like Social Security but they were paying into the system. So they were building wealth for white Americans that they were being denied despite putting in the same kind of uh, labor. So when Johnson proposes this, and when it's championed even by Richard Nixon, it's understood at that moment as a beginning of repairing the damage uh, that had been done. It gets corrupted, though, starting in the Reagan era, and then it becomes a meme for contemporary conservatives who want to simply deny, uh, A, that racial uh, discrimination and white supremacy uh, even exists, and then certainly that there should be no responsibility uh, on the part of the U.S. government, uh, which flies in the face of not only historic U.S. policy, but around the world where governments uh, and others who have have been held accountable for damage they inflicted, uh, there had to be compensation. uh, There had to be uh, uh, reparations. And so it's still an issue uh, that resonates uh, in the Black community, uh, but we're in a very different kind of uh, understanding of what uh, this history means. And what's happening now? I mean, we're now on the cusp of taking a huge step backward. Yeah, so we're about to see uh, what little vestiges of affirmative action are left uh, about to be crushed by the Supreme Court. And I think the Supreme Court, uh, beyond affirmative action, uh, they will be going after voting rights. They will be going after other gains that were made as a result of 
the civil rights and black power movement and movements by Native Americans, uh, Latinos, uh, women, uh, LGBTQ communities, uh, all of these communities that intersect and overlap are all under attack. And we're about to see, I think, a vigorous uh, rollback uh, coming out of some of the decisions uh, that are facing the court uh, in this, this present term. What will be the consequences? Oh, they're going to be harsh. And the challenge will be whether or not uh, the Democrats will be up to the task of fighting back and will they be bold, for example, uh, in expanding the court. Uh, the court as is constituted right now uh, with the 6-3 majority and that six conservative majority being relatively young uh, these individuals will be on the court the next 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, so there's just no possibility uh, unless there's some ideological metamorphosis among these members uh, that they're going to push the court back towards uh, democratic rights, political rights, uh, rights for, for all of these different communities. So uh, I think that that just requires a boldness on the part of Democrats if they have the opportunity uh, to push back uh, and, and try to bring some more balance to the court. Uh, but it will be harsh. Uh, we've already saw it in terms of uh, the decision affecting women uh, with the Dobbs decision. Uh, we can go back to Citizens United, how that's impacted the political uh, mainstream in the country. Uh, Voting Rights Act has been attacked a couple of times, and now it's just a matter of putting the last stab wound in uh, in this particular session of the court. Uh, there's some possibilities of challenging uh, and having alternatives at the state level, uh, but uh, it's really kind of what the court does that's, that has to also be addressed. You're right. Racialized attacks on the welfare state have been a successful method for getting white people to reject policies that would directly benefit them such as the subsidized health care system known as Obamacare. It is in this manner that white supremacy has been manipulated by corporate and political interests, which was why liberation movements must focus not just on the abolition of racial injustice, but also on freedom from the multiple ways power marginalizes people, particularly women of color, and denies them their full human Agency. Well, this is really the playbook of the new Republican Party. I think Glenn Ford used to call it the white man's party under Trump. Um, but it works. It's always worked. Yeah, it certainly has. And uh, what the re contemporary Republican Party has made clear is that uh, vigilance is permanent, that you, uh, there is no comfort level uh, from making really remarkable gains uh, over the last uh, half century, uh, going back from the 60s to the present, uh, for communities that were marginalized uh, and repressed and, and denied. Uh, but th it never stopped. And we can see it uh, in areas like healthcare, for example. So uh, in the book, I talk about Harriet Tubman, uh, who was injured when she was uh, enslaved, when she was about 11 or 12 or so. Uh, she had a devastating blow to the head uh, that for the rest of her life uh, gave her seizures, headaches. She would often literally just sort of pass out in mid-sentence. Uh, so she had a you know, very harsh uh, uh, injury that she had to live with. But that is what happened to people who were enslaved. There were no efforts at taking care of their health interests beyond what could be used to produce whatever work they were doing. And that carried on all the way up until today. Uh, W.B. Du Bois, uh, who mostly is noted for his speaking out around political rights and civil rights and such, also spoke out and wrote about health care for the Black community and did a couple of critical uh, reports and studies that looked at everything from Black people in insurance to Black medical schools to how Black people were treated in white hospitals. So the issue has been there uh, for a long, long, long time. 
Uh, it was there during the pandemic that happened in 1918-1919, where there was disproportionate abandonment of the Black community uh, to the pandemic of that moment. So it's not really shocking when we get to 2020, and particularly with Trump as president, that there will be a very disproportionate uh, approach. And in effect, uh, if left up to the Trump administration, would have completely abandoned uh, Black communities, Brown communities, Native American communities, uh, who were initially the most devastated uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's talk about critical race theory that's under attack. Books are being purged from uh, school curriculums. Uh, you know, the charge of the right is that they paint America as a racist society. Well, of course, that happens to be true. Um, but th- th- this assault uh, is not just political. It is also a pushback against any attempt to uh, rectify the mythology that has uh, dominated uh, the country through white supremacy. Yep. I I, I wrote somewhere that uh, critical race theory explains the opposition to critical race theory. And by that, I mean, critical race theory says that there is systemic and historic racial discrimination. And it isn't just about individuals, but it's about institutions and it's about systems of power. And unless those are dismantled, then you will continue with the disproportionalities that we see in education, employment, housing, environmental, uh, and so forth. And that's where the opposition really has understood that you have to attack critical race theory because you can't allow that kind of framing of racial politics uh, to seep into the society and begin to look at it really isn't just about individuals. Uh, And that's important because we've seen an elevation of Black people, Latinos, and others uh, in these conservative and far-right circles, which would uh, seem to augur against a uh, racial through line. But in fact, it's irrelevant that you've got an Ali Alexander, for example, who's leading the Stop the Steal movement because, in fact, the Stop the Steal movement is about stopping Black votes. And so it doesn't matter who actually is kind of heading that up. It's operating in the interest of white supremacy. And so that's really uh, what critical race theory uh, uh, gets at. Uh, It initially began looking at the way in which law uh, and the legal structures of these countries uh, from the very beginning were embedded with white supremacist uh, notions. Absolutely true. And it traces that from the beginning of the country, starting with the U.S. Constitution, uh, all the way up until uh, today. And then more generally, uh, looking at other systems of uh, racial uh, power uh, that exist. And so critical race theory is a threat. Uh, to to those who do not want to bring about uh, the changes that are needed in this country. Uh, but critical race theory in and of itself is not taught uh, in elementary schools or high schools. It's not even taught at the undergraduate level. Uh, right. for that. Well, that's the other irony. None of them are teaching critical race theory anyway. Um, well, I mean, the, this is a playbook right out of colonialism where uh, the 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 people who pull the strings. Uh, I worked in the Congo, uh, so you you put a Mobutu in power, uh, but essentially the the Belgian colonists, the French colonists, uh, continue to have control. We did the same thing in Latin America. That's the role of these figures, figures like Clarence Thomas. So uh, they they do the bidding of uh, the white overlords and 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 uh, the system itself remains intact. That's exactly right. And I'm glad you mentioned uh, Clarence Thomas, uh, because it's hard to find a more uh, direct sort of validation of that argument that it really isn't just about, you know, what uh, someone particularly looks like. 
uh, is really, you know, to what degree they're in a position of power and how do they use that power. Uh, and Clarence Thomas, uh, since he first emerged uh, as a public figure, uh, has been absolutely central to this turn towards authoritarianism uh, and far-right power. Uh, and I would add Jenny Thomas uh, to that list uh, as well. And so we are fighting against uh, that type of uh, mythology uh, that it's not about race, that it, this is just about something else. But in fact, uh, it absolutely is. Well, there's a kind of protean quality you learn, you know, going all the way back to slave patrols to militarized police that use lethal force and what Malcolm X call our internal colonies, uh, the vast prison archipelagos across the country. Uh, it, it shifts, it changes its facade, uh, but it remains the same. And I think that's what critical race theory uh, begins to examine and address and why it's important. That was Clarence Lusane, the author of $20 and Change, Harriet Tubman, and the Ongoing Fight for Racial Justice and Democracy. I want to thank the Real News Network and its production team, Cameron Granadino, Adam Coley, David Hebden, and Kayla Rivera. You can find me at chrishedges.substack.com. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.